and running. Yes, we are. Hey! It's Galen, the fire chief. It's bringing the flame storm from now to the hill. Hey! I'm the fireman, fire's in my hand, raging through the land. Boy, boy, I want you to bless the fire. Show me your lighters all night, put the lighters up in the air. Give them fire no one, just bless the fire. Show me them lighters tonight. Put right, hi folks, good evening. We're not actually necessarily looking to blaze the fire this evening so much as talk about fire, discuss fire and also discuss the ways in which we can protect ourselves against um fire uh, especially fires in our homes give me one second here so this morning i was having a conversation with members of my family my my family unit and we and we were talking about the ways in which we could fireproof our homes, make our, make our homes um, safer for us, those of us that, you know, those of us that are um, fortunate enough to be living in our own homes. And so everybody was there on the family group chat in WhatsApp, talking back and forth to one another, how to do this, how to do that, um, and, you know, throwing out suggestions. And of course, this all came on the heels of that story from yesterday that very 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 tragic story and of course thoughts prayers sentiments condolences go out to that family um in rukrina maraval wherein they would have um lost three children within the family and of course the father having to be um exposed to the horror of attempting to rescue his family and not being able to rescue everyone so I was having the conversation this morning and then I reached out to one of my friends in the fire service and said if I want to be able to have a conversation with somebody from the Toronto Tobago fire service to be able to discuss this issue and to discuss how we can best prepare ourselves how we can set up our homes in such a way that we um, uh, you know, it's safer, fireproof in that way. How do I go about it? And he sent me a couple numbers and I called a couple persons and I was finally able to get someone from the Toronto Tobago Fire Service to agree to have a conversation with us here this evening. And you would have seen that um, sub-officer, for acting fire sub-officer Jude Rogers from the Fire Prevention and Central Communications Unit agreed to be a part of the program this evening. And let me bring him on screen one time. Hello, how are you doing? Good evening, Acting Fire Sub-Officer Jude Rogers. How are you? Just now, he's muted himself. Oh, you've muted yourself. You need to unmute yourself. I need to let him know that he has muted himself. Okay, hopefully he's on. Ah, there you go. He's unmuted himself. Hi, good evening. How are you doing? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank I hope you. you're hearing me loud and clear. Yes, I'm hearing you loud and clear. And the, um, the uniform is loud and clear as well. <laughs> very sharp, very crisp. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I know you've had a really long day today. And it would have been a yes. hectic day, especially in light of yesterday's um, story, um, yesterday's tragic incident. Um, and I was sharing with the audience that um, I was having a conversation with my family and reached out to the TTFS. And in the course of reaching out to the TTFS, you were able to get approval to be able to come on here and have a conversation with us. So the first thing I want to do is... Um, introduce you to the audience. So you are acting fire sub officer Jude Rogers. How long have you been with the, 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 the fire service and what exactly do you do with the fire service? Okay, yeah, I've been a member of the Trinidad Tobago Fire Service as of 2002. Um, so if you look at that, that would be approximately 17 going on 18 years in the mm -hmm. fire service. Mm -hmm. um, I've served um, in the capacity of a firefighter um, for the majority of that time. Um, 
up to the um, 2017. Um, and then I took up an acting appointment as a fire sub officer, which is the first rank um, uh, uh, that moves from a firefighter to an officer level. Right. Um, I've been a member of the Trinidad Tobago Fire Service Fire Prevention Unit, which is charged with the responsibility mm -hmm. of public awareness, right? Community awareness, as well as fire investigations, mm -hmm. and also in relation to inspections of buildings on behalf of the Trinidad Tobago Fire Service. Okay, so all that's right. A very, uh, it sounds like a very sounds like a a a, a, lo a wide ranging portfolio there, uh, certainly within that unit. So. Give me a sense of some of the re duties or responsibilities that that unit has to tackle. What do you What do you have to tackle on a week? What What is a week like for you? Right. Um, I'm glad that you asked that question. A week A week as a fire prevention officer can see you ranging from scheduled inspections of buildings. Mm -hmm. That is new buildings which have been um, a marked for construction or buildings that are seeking approval under the OSH Act, Part Five of the OSH Act. Um, occupancies or building owners are responsible for applying to the chief fire officer to get a fire and life safety certificate for their building. So when you see uh, a building has gone up or is in the process of being built mm -hmm. and you, you are thinking, well, what's taking place there? The chief fire officer has to put his stamp of approval on those plans mm -hmm. um, before they are enacted. Um, buildings that are seeking to be used by government officials must have an approval from the fire service as well. So you see schools going up, you see those buildings that are going to be used as ministries. Mm -hmm. So, I'm wondering if his feed has stuck. Yeah, I think his feed, I think the feed, the feed is stuck a little bit. Let me know when you're hearing me, please. Officer Rogers. I'm going to exit him from the room and let him dial back in. All right, hopefully he will dial back in. Because I, I, what we want to discuss is important. <clears throat> Apart from the things that he, that he's, that he has to do um, in terms of his, his portfolio, I also want him to get into giving us advice about how best we can fireproof our homes. And there's a lot of work that is going on within the Trinidad Tobago Fire Service in terms of awareness. So hopefully we're in a position to um to talk about all of those things. Right, you're back. Tell me, let me know if you're hearing me. You're hearing me? Yeah, um, one of the challenges that I'm going to face is the fact that my phone rings continuously and ah, I'm using my phone to come with Yes, TV. yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask those persons who um, may be trying to reach me and sometimes it's, it may be, it could be an emergency as well. Mm -hmm. um, but if it were, I, I probably would have picked up on that because we'll have a wireless set right here okay. um, if, if needs be. Okay, um, all right. Yeah? Yeah, so. fair enough. Also, um, Rhoda, yes? Rhoda one, of the, one of the main things that the fire prevention unit does is when there's a fire, someone has somebody calling him again oh my goodness <sighs> i'm gonna try and see if we could start this on a laptop or something because Th you're still sticking you know this is one of the reasons i am um, i opt to use a tablet because people just call you while you're working off your phone I rather suspect that he's getting a number of calls on his phone. This is why I tell people all the time, no unsolicited phone calls. Because I use my phone as a work device. And there are lots of times when people call me on my phone and I am in the middle of doing an interview or I'm in the middle of doing work. So it's actually very sensible now to message people first before you call them on their devices because their devices are functioning as work devices very often so you're back right. okay I'm let me ask and, let me um, ask that, this that was uh, that was important and i had the person to get get to understand that i'm doing an interview fair and enough this this is the mutual of my officer from time to time you have mm -hmm. to respond to emergencies yeah. on the spot so what i want to i want to so, what, what i want to ask is should we switch so can can we switch or should we switch to you 
on a, on a laptop. Do you have like a laptop or a computer close by? Because I can send the link to that. And um, we yes, you can. Yes. You're gonna yes, have, you you're gonna have to WhatsApp me your your email address or or the exact link that I sent to you on WhatsApp. You can copy and mm -hmm. paste it onto the into your, your system in on the laptop and just and just dial back in from that. All right. Um, well, unfortunately, yeah. um, the laptops, uh, the laptops, would, I wouldn't be able to access them here. Well, then let's, the let's, let's continue here. Let's continue here. We, we can continue here. I'm yeah, fine, I'm I fine believe, with that. I believe that, that, that we're going to continue. And um, I, I hope people know there's the nature sometimes of live television. Yes. <laughs> and uh, live, you know, I, 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 yes. I can make an apology for it. You no, know, no, apologize. you don't. You do not need to apologize. You do not need to apologize. I can't begin to tell you how many times I have been in the middle of doing a live and people are calling me on my phone, like, and they know that I'm doing a live and they're calling me on 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 my phone. I I don't know what they expect me to do if they expect me to actually answer the call. In any case, so move. Let's let's move. You were explaining to me what a week is like in your life as a fire sub officer in that unit that you're working in. Yes. So um, directly relating to the, the, the core function, which I believe is the fire investigations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes all of the that we make as fire officers to be proactive and to share information with the public, mm -hmm. it may not pan out that there is going to be a tragedy. And yeah. when a tragedy occurs, um, the fire service now must come in and be the one or we're charged with that responsibility of identifying the cause. We're also charged with the responsibility of, of going through the, the actual evidence to determine sometimes a crime is, has been committed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it may be of an accidental nature mm -hmm. and, and other times. So, so you can you can imagine the range of, of, of activities that can take place coming out of a fire. Mm -hmm. And so um, the fire service does have jurisdiction and that's something that I want the, the members of the public to know. If a fire does occur at your home, at your business place or wherever you may be functioning, you must report that to the fire service first and foremost. Right. And obviously, one of the number to reach the fire service is 990. Mm -hmm. All right. It's pretty close to the police officers' numbers. And actually, we operate on a similar platform. So if you call 999, you yeah. can actually be transferred over to 990 and vice versa. Right. So we are on the same platform. Okay. All right. But it is so important that we, we understand that aspect of it. And of course, community awareness and training, basically what I'm doing here with you today, mm -hmm. which is expounding what the fire service does and sharing information, which will help persons to be aware of what their role and function is. So, Officer yes. Rogers, you were talking about um, having to inspect buildings, but the buildings you were talking about seem to be public sector buildings, right? So the government, you mentioned government buildings. Um, so are there fire codes for buildings in this country? Because I didn't realize that there were fire codes for buildings in this country. Right. So let's speak about the legislation that surrounds the, the uh, property and property development. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, yes, there is legislation that governs the, the structures that we have. And there is a building code in Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. um, that is done through the Tongue and Country. And Tongue and Country will advise you that you need to send your plans to the Ministry of Health. You need to send your plans to the fire service and a number of other government agencies which must put their stamp of approval on your plans before you can go ahead and build it. All right? Mm -hmm. So what you have is a situation where once you are, um, and, and some of these laws, people tend to try to get around them. Mm -hmm. All right? And that can help that, you know, and they tend to try to get around those laws because once you have your own funding and you are able to, to provide the funding, sometimes you can go ahead and build. But then when you want to, to seek the approval of government on certain levels, you're going to end up getting having to go right back to the to getting and seeking the approvals from the necessary agencies. So mm -hmm. it's best to do the right thing and to submit your plans before you actually go and build. And you can see the pitfalls if you don't do that. Right. If you don't do that, and you let's say you build a structure mm -hmm. and you are building an upper floor structure and you only put one stairway because you think that that is what is all that is necessary. But when you submit our plans to us, the fire service says, well, we must have two ways in and out of the building. And we tell you that you need to have an additional stairway. So how, um, how, do, how do I, how do I, okay, so let me, re, let me say this. I've never built a home. Where I live, I bought, right? I purchased it. So I would imagine yeah. that the person who did the building, they would have had to have gone because it, it got town and country approval. So they would have had to go yeah. and submit their plans somewhere. 
So let's yes. let's assume that I am building a home for the first time. How do I get my yes. home plans approved by the fire services? Right. So members of the public are advised that they can either reach out to us or fire prevention units are located in each of the, the divisions of Trinidad and Tobago and they're subdivided into central division headquarters located in Chaguanas, mm -hmm. the fire prevention northern division headquarters located on Rice and Road, Port of Spain, mm -hmm. um, the Tobago division headquarters located in the Scarborough fire station mm -hmm. and the southern division, you submit your plans there and that is um, located in Monrepo um, fire station, that is the southern headquarters. Mm -hmm. All right. But all of the plans really come to one unit called the fire prevention administration unit. Right. All right. And that, that unit is actually located in central division. So we make it easy for persons to, instead of having the northern people have to go all the way down to the south, you come to one central point, submit your plans. Mm -hmm. um, we go through the plans. We actually plot on that plan the requirements, whether it's a smoke detector, fire extinguisher, exit signs, um, whether you need to have fire hose reels. All of these are measures that we put in place. Mm -hmm. We talk about it. You know, and when we put that in, you get back your plans, you build your building and you implement and we come back and do a review. Yeah. And once that is done, you are given a final certificate. So let's say, so I come to you with a three bedroom. Let's go with a basic family home, right? Three bedrooms, two bathrooms. So this is, I think that's like the standard for, for a number of homes. Standard home. What are, and so one level, right? So single story, three bedrooms, two bathrooms. What are some of the, the, the things you recommend or you suggest happen with a, with a home like that to make sure that it is fire safe and fire ready? Okay, excellent question. So the fact that you are on the ground floor, mm -hmm. that's an added advantage. So just look, let's look at the structure itself mm -hmm. and we, what we do is a hazard analysis. Right. So let's look at the potential dangers with having a, a structure that, uh, say, a, as opposed to a structure that is four stories high. Mm -hmm. So when I add that anomaly, you begin to realize if I have four stories high, it means I'm going to have to make my way down. Mm -hmm. But if I'm on a flat, a flat, the normal flats, then what I really need is two ways in and out of the flat house, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. right? And that could be your front door and your back door or side door, all right? So there's, the, you must, it's called the means of escape. Your means of escape or your exit route is, an, is a, a location or a pathway that you take where you have, you don't need any aid whatsoever to just walk in the opposite direction mm -hmm. and just open the door and you are outside. Mm -hmm. Once you have to improvise, you have to jump through a window, you have to put down a rope ladder, you have to tie a sheet, that is not considered a means of escape. Mm. A means of escape and a proper exit route can it has to be something that is engineered into your structure to facilitate the systematic and strategic evacuation from your structure. Okay. And that is what... Plan. That's what we look at when we design and we, we give instructions and we give requirements on your plans. Simply have two means in and out, unencumbered and no blockage, open and available to all occupants to be utilized in the event of an emergency. If it's a two-story home, one. right, so that's level one. If it's a two-story home, what do you, what do you implement for a two-story home? Right. So when you when you when you talk about a two story home again, you must have that two ways in and out of the building. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of challenges when you start going up and you know with upper floors, mm -hmm. because now you 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 have now to, the travel distance has increased, and now you have the the added um, hazard of the height of the mm -hmm. building. So again, the same rule applies: two ways in and out of the building, normally on the opposite side. So you wouldn't put two front doors in the same location side by side and say that I. I have achieved two exits because if the fire is in the back, you must easily turn and go to the front. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, once we have um, structures such as that, the fire service then would recommend offering you an alternative. I suspect another call has come in. I may have to have him call back in. So bear with us because he's working <laughs> he's working from his phone and he's doing this interview off his phone. 
So we're talking to Fire Sub Officer Jude Rogers and he's talking us through the things that you need to consider when you are um, setting up setting up a home in terms of you know fire safety. Right, we're back. We're up and running. Right, we're up and running. Right, so again, forgive me, but um, you have to understand what the challenges with the limited um, resources, and mm -hmm. you know, we, we, will, we will make do. We will yes. make do. Yeah. All right. So you were right. telling so, me about you're telling me about the the, the 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 basic things that you have in place, right? So two ways to get in and out of the house comfortably, um, and not necessary, yeah. and they they ought not to be close to each other. So whether it's back and front mm -hmm. or front and side or whatever, you must have these two ways to get in and out of the the, the building. Correct. All right. In addition to that, um, we know for a fact that sometimes challenges do happen. So what you want to do. The key thing here with, with, with fires is that you need something that can alert you in advance. Mm -hmm. We're going about our busy lives. We're doing stuff. Your home has multiple rooms. Mm -hmm. What is going to alert you? You need an early warning device. Right. That early warning device is either going to be a fire alarm system mm -hmm. that's taking it to another level, mm -hmm. or it could be as simple as a battery-operated smoke and heat detectors. Okay. So smoke and... So so Two ways to get in, and smoke and heat detectors. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So, how do we locate those heat detectors? Where should we put a smoke detector? Mm -hmm. Those are not, those are advice that you should seek from your your fire officer, your fire prevention department. Mm -hmm. Because, and I'm going to tell you the reason for that. I'm just um, Roda. It's simple. Um, you wouldn't want to put a smoke detector in your kitchen. Obvious, for obvious reasons. Because it, the kitchen is always warm. It's the warmest part of the house. <laughs> Not just be warm, but think about it. And I, I, I like to put it in colloquial terms. If you're, if you're, if you're going to cook, you're going to... to, to yeah, to, to that's, what I, mean. that, yeah that's what I mean. When I say it's the warmest part of the house, you're absolutely... You're, yeah. you're, you're, and once, I mean, once you're a person who's cooking, you know that that's the part, of, that will be the most sensitive part of the house. So if you put a smoke detector there, mm -hmm. it's always going to be going off. That's right. So we need to fit the right device for the right purpose. Mm -hmm. So now, in the past, we did not have battery-operated heat detectors. But now you can acquire a battery-operated heat detector. Okay. So the heat detector will go into the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Because we recognize, yes, we're going to do cooking, but we need a detection that can work in the kitchen. I mean, not, we can't use a smoke detector because it becomes a nuisance mm -hmm. when it goes off all the time. And if you cry wolf all the time, what eventually happens, you get accustomed mm -hmm. and you start to ignore the sound of the alarm. Mm -hmm. And what we don't want is for persons to get inoculated mm -hmm. against your fire alarm and the sound of your smoke detector. Right, and so then when we they start hearing it, they're ignoring it. Gotcha. That's right. We do not ever want persons to become so comfortable and complacent mm -hmm. that they begin to ignore the fact that the alarm is going off. I said, no, 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 that, that, that may be a false alarm. Right. But in the case of fire, I'm saying there are no false alarms. Mm -hmm. You respond to each and every call or emergency or sound of the alarm as though it's the real thing. Mm -hmm. I can't stress that enough. So the place that you make that determination mm -hmm. is at your master point, which is on the outside of your building. You make the determination as to whether it was, it is, or it is a false alarm mm -hmm. outside. So that brings me to another topic. Yes, now before we go to the, before we get, before we get to evacuation muster point, you were talking about smoke and heat detectors, and you, we, yes. you know, putting a heat detector in the kitchen. Are there any other rooms in the home that you would recommend yes. a heat detector be placed in? And where would you actually ask me to put a smoke detector? Right, so the heat detector again, because the bathroom is an area that would um, generate steam and possibly even uh, moisture, mm -hmm. you would not want to put a smoke detector in your bathrooms. Okay. So you you may you may also use a heat detector in that area in that general area, mm -hmm. um, and um, the smoke detectors are really designed to work in areas where we know that we're not going to generate any sort of smoke. So once we know smoke develops in your bedroom, we know you're not supposed to have smoke in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. We know for sure. That has to be a fire mm -hmm. be generated and causing that alarm to trip off. Okay. In some instances, we ask persons to put it on the corridors because the first place that the smoke exit is, exits when it comes through the, the bedroom doors would be into the corridors. Mm -hmm. All right? 
So if you can't afford to put one in every bedroom, you can still place them along the corridors. All right? And smoke detectors go at the highest point in your room and normally to the center of the room. Okay. All right? Because the first thing that smoke does when it emanates from, from whatever is burning, the combustion process, it rises mm -hmm. and it begins to mushroom and create that convection process, just like a convection oven. Mm -hmm. So the heat rises, fresh air to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that, that is going to be part of the discussion that we're going to have later on as well. Okay. All right. So smoke detectors in the bedroom and corridors. What about laundry rooms? Because I have a, I have a dryer. So I'm just yeah, wondering I, where should should I, you know? Definitely, I, you can use this smoke detector there. Once there is not the generation of too much steam, constantly yeah. steam coming up. Yeah. So I feel I, I believe that in a, in, a, in in those areas as well, the smoke detector will be highly effective because once there's smoke gener generating in your washrooms, yeah. it in or in your or your laundry rooms, it means that there is actually a fire taking place. Okay. All right. All right. So heat detectors for the kitchen, but smoke detectors for the laundry room. That's it. Okay. That's All right. it. Okay. Gotcha. Right. So there was a, you were heading on to talk about, I think, evacuation plans. Yeah. yeah the evacuation plans. So there comes a point in time when all of the measures that you've put in place have failed mm -hmm. or have not been successful. Mm -hmm. um, and a fire does occur. So what do we do? Do we stand and throw hands up in the air and we give up? No, we don't. We need to have a device which is very effective mm -hmm. on fire, on in extinguishing fires. And that device is called a fire extinguisher. Yeah. All right. And, 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 and I may talk about the different types of extinguishers, but more importantly, I need to talk about what the fire extinguisher is able to do in what we consider to be the incipient or the early stage of a development of a fire. What size really ex, what, what size should I get? Right, okay, good. What type and what size yeah. should you get? Type, type and size. Size is important. Mm -hmm. Because there are, there, there are quite a few different types of extinguishers and some work more effectively in certain types of situations. Okay. So let's start off with your basic extinguisher that everybody knows. Water type extinguisher. Mm -hmm. Water. As we know, Water works very well on carbonaceous or wood paper plastics. Mm -hmm. But water doesn't work well on electricity. Mm -hmm. In fact, water is a conductor of electricity and you really don't want to use an extinguisher on an electrical base fire or electrical fire fire started by electrical means. You mm -hmm. can get shocked. So you really want to have an extinguisher that would work well on it. But it would work well on paper, cans, trash, wood, paper, plastics within your homes. Right. So... Let's, let's put a pin on the water type extinguisher for now. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the dry chemical powder extinguisher. Okay. Dry chemical powder. So the dry chemical powder works well on certain classes of fire. And fire, uh, so for the purpose of extinguishing, mm -hmm. are classified into class A, class B, class C, mm -hmm. class D. And they have more classes. Mm -hmm. Fire is quite um, fire has a lot of class. I yeah. tell the ladies that all the time. Fire has a real class. Mm -hmm. You understand? So if you think you have class as a lady, the fire have more class. More than class you. than so, me. Got but you. We, it, it, is, it, is this, it is really to determine what type of material is burning. Mm -hmm. The classification of fires is to determine what is actually on fire, and that determines the type of extinguisher that is best suited. Right. So when I say dry powder, dry chemical, that works well on class A, B, and C. That's mm -hmm. three classes under one extinguisher. Yeah. And that to me is the most versatile extinguisher and is the one that I'm going to recommend for your homes. Okay. Dry chemical powder or the A, B, C extinguisher works okay. well on wood, paper, plastics. B, mm -hmm. flammable liquids, and mm -hmm. C, gaseous or ga gas material. Okay, so the ABC so extinguisher, that's what you would recommend for a that's house. Right. Okay. That's correct. That's correct. Now, we normally also, there's another type called the carb, carbon dioxide, which is a gas. It only comes out in the form of a gas. You remember mm -hmm. dry powder is a, is a powder. It's sort of messy. Mm -hmm. Water, obviously, we need conducts with electricity. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the gas extinguisher is carbon dioxide. Now, the carbon dioxide is able to to get into spaces that you your powder and your water can't get into. Right. And it's really designed specifically for electronic equipment and for fires of an electrical nature. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine 
let's say your electronics is on fire, your, your, your computer or something like that is burning. You can't get water into your computer parts, mm -hmm. nor would you want to put a, a harmful dry powder into that. Mm -hmm. So your CO2 or your carbon dioxide extinguisher mm -hmm. is now able to be expelled into that area, into that zone, and is now able to remove the oxygen from the process and extinguish the fire, right? So mm -hmm. you're literally starving the fire of oxygen, okay. all right? So I'm not going to go into fire science too much today. No, no, fire no, triangle, no, 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 no. But it's just basically, let's go with the dry chemical powder yeah. because of the numerous class that it covers. Class A, B, and C. So we've talked about how to get in and out. We've talked about the smoke detectors mm -hmm. and the heat detectors. We've talked about mm -hmm. fire extinguishers. And you were talking about an evacuation plan or an evacuation point. Yes. So again, you've you've attempted to use your fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. You've been trained by the Trinity Tobago Fire Service. Okay, truly, so or when I get officers. it, when I get it, I have to come and get training. That that yes, I I have to you get training. Have to come and get some training from okay. the fire service. Okay. And um, obviously, for this purpose, I'm just going to introduce the basic acronym that we use for the use of a fire extinguisher, mm -hmm. and that is a system called PASS. P A S S mm -hmm. because the fire extinguisher has various parts. Now, um, I, I have an extinguisher right next to me here that I took the liberty of um, bringing in. Thank right? you. <laughs> because I knew that members of the public, visual is always better than... than, than yes, um, you agreed. Know. So I have my trusty fire extinguisher here. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see it. No, right? we're, seeing, we uh, we're seeing you absolutely fine. We're seeing you absolutely right. fine. So let me go back. Let me go back a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this particular fire extinguisher, red in color, guys, all red fire extinguishers does not mean that it has dry powder. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can get a white um, water type extinguisher with, with, with and it's red. Mm -hmm. But the basic tenants you can see, you have the body of the extinguisher. You have the carrying handle, mm -hmm. which I'm holding the extinguisher by. Mm -hmm. You have on top the discharge lever. Right? Mm -hmm. You have a safety pin which holds the extinguisher in place, the lever in place so it doesn't depress or extinguish while it's not in use. This is very important, the safety pin. Mm -hmm. Here I have, um, Rhoda, if you look closely here, yeah. you can see there's a safety gauge. Yes. And in that gauge, they want that needle to always be in the green zone, which means full. Mm -hmm. That extinguisher is full. All right? I have here the discharge nozzle. Yes. All right? And the end of my nozzle, you notice the end of my nozzle is the type of nozzle that we have here. Yes. All right, that's important. That is the, the, the discharge nozzle. Uh -huh. And this is where the dry powder would, would, would be expelled from. All right? Um, so these are the parts of the extinguisher. Now to, and to safely and to properly um, execute the whole extinguishion of a, of a fire, uh -huh. you want to follow the acronym PASS. So P yeah. would be to pull the pin. You have right. to pull the pin out. Right. It's designed to come out once it is that you pull that on that pin. I normally put my finger in and twist. Right. So I know that I'm, when I'm using my hands to pull that pin out, I'm not holding this, the extinguisher in place like this. Mm -hmm. Because if I hold the extinguisher in place and I try to pull the pin, the pin will not come out. Mm -hmm. So I tell patients to basically put your finger in, do not depress the discharge, discharge lever, turn and pull. Mm -hmm. Your pin is now out. When the pin is out, you go on to the next acronym, which is A. Mm -hmm. That is to aim the nozzle at the base of what is actually burning. Mm -hmm. So you are aiming at the base of the fire. Mm -hmm. Now, why am I aiming at the base? Why am I saying to aim at the base? I can aim at the flames. Yeah. But the flames is really, it is the byproduct of the combustion process. Below that combustion process is, is where the actual chemical discharge is, is taking place and that reaction is taking place. That is where you want to focus the medium. Mm -hmm. So when you focus the medium at that point, right, to do that, you have to squeeze on the discharge lever. So my next S is S, squeeze. squeeze. And, and the last S is to sweep from side to side. Right. So what I do when I sweep from side to side, mm -hmm. I am actually evenly painting on that powder onto what is burning thus excluding the oxygen on the outside and covering that material with powder the the combustion triangle is now broken the fire cannot continue so pull pull aim pull, pull aim, aim squeeze and squeeze, and sweep and sweep that's side, it right right so pull aim right? squeeze and sweep 
gotcha, gotcha. So gotcha. I want to ask, I want to ask this. I've often heard that extinguishers mm -hmm. need to be serviced and serviced regularly. How regularly are they meant to be serviced? All right. So extinguishers should one be inspected or checked upon mm -hmm. on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. right? So, so I'm not going to wait. This is what we call preventative maintenance. You're not going to wait until you actually need the extinguisher to start doing your checks. Mm -hmm. So you can do a visual check. Come on, check the extinguisher. Take a look at the gauge. Make sure the gauge is in the in the correct zone. The extinguisher is full. It's pressurized. You check in the nozzle, make sure that the orifice is, is open, that mm -hmm. no nothing has put any blockage in the orifice mm -hmm. and is free and, and in place, right? Um, however, uh, annually, you should have your extinguisher service or checked by a professional. Right. So there are companies in Trinidad and Tobago, safety companies mm -hmm. that have the mechanism and the certification to be able to check on the equipment that can check and test your, your equipment on an annual basis. Okay. All right? So that's basically for a household. The greater the hazard, the shorter the time frame required for your servicing. Okay. So you can imagine a householder, maybe annually, but an organization where the hazards have increased, such as probably like an offshore facility yeah. or even a facility of a higher nature where the hazards are higher, they will have to do a little more checks on a more regular basis, probably okay. quarterly right. or even biannually. Okay. Fair enough? Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So what, okay, so we've done, we've talked about the two ways to get in and get out. This, you know, smoke detectors, heat detectors, um, fire extinguishers, um, 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 muster point. We talked about, we talked about. Now we come into the evacuation right, procedure. Right, evacuation procedure. That's my next level of protection. So again, we've, we've done all that we can prior to the fire. We've mm -hmm. made sure that our homes have two ways in and out. We've we've found an early detection devices so that we can be awakened in the, in the still of night, 3 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. Fire somehow seems to, to love 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning when you're at your best point of rest. Mm -hmm. And that's when fire seems to occur most often. So you are uh, you are the, you're awoken by the early warning device, your smoke detectors. Mm -hmm. You attempted to extinguish the fire but was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. Now you have no choice but to leave your home. All right? And how do you do that? How do you do you do that in a frantic manner? Do you do that in a, do, does the evacuation process begin only when the fire begins? Or is this something that you need to plan for? That you need to prepare? Mm -hmm. and put and make arrangements mm -hmm. is this something that your family members need to be aware of and the answer to all of those questions are yes so an evacuation procedure is something is the strategic movement of persons in a building from a point of danger to a point of safety in a strategic and organized manner that is the definition for an evacuation procedure mm -hmm. all right so what we want to do we would want to help others help the persons within our homes to have a healthy awareness of what are the steps in our evacuation procedure mm -hmm. and it simply begins with that when you are when you are you notice the fire let's say you're in your home how many persons um, are in your home let's just give me say four persons live in your home yeah um Rhoda? yeah four persons right that one person discovers the fire that person now has the responsibility to alert each and every other member of the family Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? If the smoke detector fails to alert you, you use your mouth mm -hmm. and you shout out, fire, fire, fire. And and when a member of your home hears that sound or hears somebody shouting out fire, they know that that is a serious call for them to evacuate. Mm -hmm. Their thought pattern is immediately goes to the point where they begin, I need to move mm -hmm. and I need to move quickly. Mm -hmm. It must not lead a member of the family to investigate because the normal response of human beings is, well, what, what is the problem? Where? And you begin, you begin to investigate. My, my term for it in Trinidad is the Maku. You begin, <laughs> and I sure you see this happening. You're going down the highway and there's an accident. What do people do? Yes, all of a sudden the, the traffic begins to slow mm -hmm. and you get what we call Maku traffic. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the psychology behind a person identifying that there is an emergency, we begin. We want to see. Yes. We want to see to believe. But I'm saying to you that the sound of the alarm or that person shouting out fire, fire should be enough to move me into action 
to evacuate immediately. And that is the sense of awareness that we want as fire officers to mm -hmm. reach each and every member of our nation for them to understand. And I'm going to tell you the reason why that is so too, um, um, Amruda. You see, buildings are made up of materials which are constructed and have certain lifespans. Right. You can have your traditional homes. Let's say we have a home traditional wood made of wood, a board house. Mm -hmm. You literally only have two minutes to evacuate a board house mm -hmm. because you do not understand the dynamics of how quickly the combustion process works. People think that they have more time. Mm -hmm. You don't. You just simply don't have the benefit of time. Mm -hmm. So for the normal board house, two minutes, you must be out. For your class B construction, and that is a class C construction, your class B construction mm -hmm. is a combination. That's your traditional structures. You know, you have a wooden house, wooden rafters, but you have concrete walls. Yeah. It's B. You have two minutes and thirty seconds to evacuate from that building. So wooden, so it, your, it, so so wooden rafters, concrete walls, two minutes and thirty seconds to get out. Two minutes and thirty seconds. That's a class B structure. You would have heard my chief fire officer allude to that mm -hmm. in the fire with the with yes, the children, mm -hmm. the classification of the building. He would have alluded to that, and that's a there's an important reason for that mm -hmm. because there's only so long that a building like that could withstand the effects of a outright fire. Mm -hmm. Now I want to come to the non-combustible structures, which most of homes are moving to the non-combustible stru structure type. Um, which is a class A structure mm -hmm. where you now have the steel beams, the Z pulling, mm -hmm. and more than likely a gypsum type ceiling. So there's no wood element in this structure. Right. These are called non-combustible class A structures. You have all of three minutes to evacuate. Wow. Think so, about that. So it's only, it's, only, it's only half a minute more you have in a class A structure. <laughs> exactly. Because now what we're doing, your house comes as an empty structure. Yeah. You get your house on the HDC, you build your house as an empty structure. Mm -hmm. There are no challenges in that. We now begin to add what is called fire load. Right. We bring the bed in. That's a mattress. Mm -hmm. That's cloth. That's carbonaceous material. Mm -hmm. You bring fridge, stove, television, electronic equipment. Those are fire hazards as well. Mm -hmm. So everything that we add to our home adds an element of risk. And we do what we do is to manage that risk. Okay. All right. So I'm in the process of teaching you or uh, uh, sharing the, the steps of the evacuation. But we do that in the con with the, with the con with, in the background of our minds. We do that with how long we actually have mm -hmm. to be able to get out of that building. Now there are a couple of questions right? coming in from the audience, and I feel I want to throw some of sure. them out at you. The persons sure. are asking if you are in an apartment that does not have a fire escape or the apartment only has one way in one way out what are you supposed to do if a, if a fire starts all right okay so that's a that's an excellent question mm -hmm. um folks it all depends on how high up you are in that building if you are at the fourth or fifth floor mm -hmm. you're really limited and you're really at the mercy mm -hmm. of the fire protect that are structures that are built in into that building mm -hmm. ideally ideally that building should have a fire escape route but i do know of structures that have one central stairwell mm -hmm. and that brings you up and an elevator possibly now the how the fire prevention department looks at that you have to put some sort of measure in place that is going to make this building either a smart building to be able to detect and also to be able to begin firefighting operations without you lifting a finger. Mm -hmm. So you now we get a little bit more technical because mm -hmm. in Trinidad now we see in the advent of buildings which are in excess of 20 stories high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those buildings have smart systems that allow them to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So there are smoke, there, there are fire alarm systems, which are smart systems. Mm -hmm. They detect the specific room, the specific location of a fire and and actually triggers a response in the form of a sprinkler system, mm -hmm. triggers the response in the form of a gas or com, um, suppression system that snuffs out the fire before you even know that there was a fire. Mm -hmm. But there are also homes where you may not have the benefit of those types of smart systems. And I am suggesting to those persons 
that in in the in the event that they are living in a building that has one way in and one way out and a fire occurs i am suggesting to them that they, they one seek that physical structure that changes that outright if you mm -hmm. are unable to change that mm -hmm. then you have to provide yourself the the, the 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 most amount of early warning devices that you can possibly have early enough to alert you to get out of the building i do not want to to focus persons on improvising right because because Rhoda, when you when you when you cause a person to begin to think about improvising, tying a bed sheet or a window sill, mm -hmm. and coming down, there are so many dangers that you can face. Mm -hmm. It is always better for us to put a, a structured way, a physical measure in place that is permanent, mm -hmm. rather than to try to improvise. Right. So I am telling members of the public, if that is what the conditions that you are currently living in, mm -hmm. let's seek to change that first. Not not let me provide you with a means or a mechanism which is is to improvise and can cause what we call a lot of mishaps yeah. seek the advice of the fire service tell the fire service put it in writing email us write to us call us and let us come in and do a, an inspection and address that anomaly and correct it by having the if, if it's a, a landlord if it's a, a whatever let them put the necessary physical fire staircase in place mm -hmm. and put that an additional door for you okay because there are buildings in Trinidad that was built so long ago that they would have missed some of the fire codes would not have been in in, in apl applicable to them at that time mm -hmm. or they may have somehow slipped through the cracks we have to address those anomalies all right mm -hmm. so again yes you can have your burglar proof with the the escape window that can be unlocked which is what i recommend and that you practice to place the key in a place that you alone can access mm -hmm. probably definitely not too high so that shorter members of your family cannot access it mm -hmm. but definitely i'm not going to encourage someone to have a scenario and to stay in a scenario such as that we need to seek a physical means to eradicate that outright okay someone was asking um for advice on using mosquito coils in homes because we still use mosquito oh. coils here all right so so the key the key thing with the mosquito coils is how do you actually utilize something something is a hazard by by all means and by all definition a mosquito coil is a source of ignition it's a heat source mm -hmm. so all we need for fire to take place is a source of heat a fuel and oxygen those once we combine those three things we're going to have a fire mm -hmm. all right so what you want to do is to protect that heat source from ever coming into contact with what if you will the oxygen is all around us in the mm -hmm. we can't get away from that we need mm -hmm. we need oxygen to live just like a fire mm -hmm. but if i eliminate the fuel from that scenario there will never be a fire scenario mm -hmm. taking place and how do you do that you do not do the risky behavior by placing the mosquito, mosquito coil in close proximity to combustible material. Mm -hmm. You make sure that it doesn't have a chance for the topple over to take place. And if you place that in a canister or in a metal base or a ceramic base um, canister that has, even if it topples over, it's still not going to come in contact with combustible material. Then you're offering some sort of cautionary or control measure. That is what you want to put in place. Okay. Go ahead. Any other further questions? Yeah, yeah, there are, yeah, there are lots, there are lots of other questions. Yeah. What some someone is asking? What are the leading causes of residential fires? All right. If I were to point uh, members of Trinidad and Tobago public as to what we as fire officers or what the statistics is showing us, mm -hmm. we are recognizing three elements that that would would be the cause of leading causes of residential fires. Number one would be in because of the advent of so much of electronic equipment in the household we are now seeing that electrical or fires origin from a, originating from an electrical means as one of the number one causes or one of the leading causes of fires mm -hmm. um in trinidad and tobago mm -hmm. in addition to that we have accidental fires which could be caused by human error and human omission so if i omit or I forget to mm -hmm. turn off the heater. Mm -hmm. If by my human error, I leave something on the stove, 
well alight and it reaches that point where it, it, it ignites other materials, you are going to have a fire. Mm -hmm. All right? So those two elements uh, are two of the major elements which we have noticed have been the cause of fires in Trinidad and Tobago. All right? And those statistics are very telling. If I were to lead, um, to give you some statistics um, as well, um, Rhoda, we, we have noticed between 2016 to 2019 that we've had approximately 68 deaths in the whole of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and that has arisen out of 700, an average of 700 household fires per year. Oh, wow. When I do the average, that tells me that there's more than two fires per day. Mm -hmm. Not all of them may lead to total destruction. But the fact of the matter is a near miss or an incident causing or leading to a fire is occurring at least twice a day in Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. in residential properties. Okay. That's an alarming it figure. Is, it's a, it is it's an alarm because I, I don't think, I mean, today, today has passed and I haven't heard about any household fire for the day. But based on your statistics, at least two houses had a fire today. Somewhere in Trinidad, mm -hmm. somewhere in Trinidad today. After the major catastrophe that took place, mm -hmm. there were at least two fires taking place, either not reported or reported to us, but it did not require a major intervention. Mm -hmm. So I want you to understand that. All right. Some fires require a full scale intervention on the part of the fire service. Mm -hmm. Others may be snuffed out or may have burnt out themselves out or may have been inter interacted by the members of who are within that household. Okay. But it is occurring and is a, a point that we are noting and we are paying specific attention to that in the Trinidad Tobago Fire Service. Okay. Now, in the in the course of the conversation between yesterday and today, I've heard people talking about things like fire blankets. What are, what are fire blankets and how are they used? So repeat that question. Fire blankets. I heard I, my sister was telling me about fire blankets. So she was talking about, you what? know, heat detectors and smoke detectors and so and then she also talked about a fire blanket. I what is what is that and how is that used? All right. So if in the in the situation where you have no choice but to evacuate your home and you, you, you your your exit routes are compromised, mm -hmm. the, the thing that you can do, you can actually create or use a fire blanket as a shield. All right. That shield now protects your back or areas of sensitive areas of your body and allows you to at least withstand because fire officers have to go into scenarios where as well where we are going into the heat mm -hmm. but we have insulation we have the fire suits right made of numex which is is able to take and withstand a certain amount of heat mm -hmm. protecting our bodies and our skin yeah. similarly a fire blanket is able to do that for an occupant in your home so if you have fire blankets in your home they can simply be dampened with water and i and and even your towel, as simple as a towel, could be dampened by water placed over the, your head, mm -hmm. your shoulders, mm -hmm. while you seek to get to the lowest point in your home because hot air and gases, you mm -hmm. cannot breathe, and that is what rises. So you're not going to stand up and walk out of the building. Mm -hmm. You literally have to crawl sometimes to get out. You have to crawl on your stomach to get out of the building, mm -hmm. and that is the nature of a fire. All right? Bearing in mind, again, the amount of time that you have available or even that could be afforded to you to evacuate and it really isn't much time mm -hmm. it's just not enough time so mm -hmm. this is why early detection is so critical and, and movement is critical i'm seeing questions here about you know what kind of household appliances or devices should people be careful about with respect to you know, causing fires in the home. I'm seeing conversations about um, fans, about cell phones, you know. So what what, what should persons be um, paying attention to in terms of the appliances and devices in their homes? Well, first of all, before I talk about the types of devices, and there are quite a few devices which pose this hazard, mm -hmm. let's talk about human behavior and our interaction with our electronic equipment and also electricity in the home. So let do me you, ask a question. Do you want me to play that video now, the one that you sent to me? Yes, you can. You can play the video now. That would be a good interjection at this point. And the, the one that with, with the admonition, not, not the one with the little child. All right? So oh, yes, the one with the little children. Yes, definitely. The one with the children? Okay, all right. Give, yes. me, give me a second. Let me just pull it up. Yeah. And we will... That's now. I know I have the video here. So that's quite funny. 
Oops, just now. Alright. Let me move me. And let me put you. I wanna pull it back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna put it pull it back a little bit. I just put a new up on your screen so that um Right, here we go. Yes, be careful. I think I'm going to start to cook, yes, because these children are hungry now, right? Okay. Oh, shucks. Oh, oh, oh. These plugs, oh my gosh. Mm. <laughs> Hey, Lisa, hey, come, come, there, come, come, there, come, 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 what we saw, what I saw in that in that video is something so commonplace. I'm I'm not even going to lie. The number of things plugged into, you know, a multi-port system, etc. 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 So how do we, you know, what what do you do in a situation like this? Because many homes will have multiple devices and they will be using multi-port systems and so how do you protect? How do you how do you guard against um I guess the dangers that 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 that, that poses. Hmm. I'm glad you asked that question, and this is why we created the video. It's to prompt that type of discussion. Um, human behavior or human interaction with electrical and electronic electricity in the home. Mm -hmm. As you saw, the hazard we presented a number of hazards. Here. One, the multi tapping mm -hmm. on one plug or one circuit, which is an overload of the circuit, which mm -hmm. can cause the heating up of that particular circuit and then that circuit is connected to combustible combustible material that combustible material is ignited because the heat source comes from the wiring mm -hmm. all right and then a fire begins as you saw at the point of the plug mm -hmm. but then you also saw a challenge where the human behavior of the mother in this family she was operating in the kitchen plug is right there and water the well. <laughs> and water and she operated all willy-nilly with water involved and her her behavior was as such that she her habits or the habits that we inculcate where we we take chances mm -hmm. we know it's wrong she obviously knew you heard her say these plugs there boy oh yeah. gosh these plugs yeah. but did she take the time to separate the electricity from water no so she's creating a hazard in her own home and those are examples that she's also setting for the children mm -hmm. all right um, so in this scenario, I'm asking members of the public to really seriously take a look at your home. Let's start going through our home and looking for the hazards. And they are there and we are aware of them. How many of us use extension cords on a permanent basis in our homes? You plug in the refrigerator, is not where you want it to be. So you run an extension cord and to the refrigerator or to the deep freeze. And that is there and it's run under a carpet or it's run under some, some covering. Mm -hmm. And that you now is permanently your way of supplying that, that unit with electricity. That in itself presents a hazard. These are an electrical cord is for temporary use. Some cords are rated for outdoors and others are rated for indoors. Mm -hmm. And we use that anyway. We interchange indoor for outdoor, outdoor for indoor. Mm -hmm. And there are hazards associated with that. In addition to that, you would have seen um, that um, the, 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 the parent in the home was also alluding to the fact that he, want, he wanted to purchase an extinguisher, but he, you know, he should have done it and he never got around to doing it. Mm -hmm. Here in the whole, the opportunity comes now where he needs the extinguisher. And that's what I want the public to know. By the time you need an extinguisher, it would be too late. You need to have that purchase, understand how to utilize it, and make other members of, and place it in a prominent position. I've known persons who purchase extinguishers and it's still in the same box that they purchased it mm -hmm. and under inside a cupboard. It is of no use. When you when there's a, a panic scenario, you're not going to remember where, where you hid you hid 
your fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. So it must be prominently located, mounted, and ready for use mm -hmm. at your exits. That's where we locate extinguisher, near mm -hmm. your exit. Now, with respect to the plug situation in the living room, let's talk about the plug situation in the living room there, where you have several multi-port systems and everything in you know plugged into one plug in the wall would you suggest what well, what would you suggest because i'm i'm here thinking surge protector but maybe there's something else you would suggest okay so the surge protector gives persons a false sense of security right so mm -hmm. when you have a surge protector you you and, and just listen to the by name alone surge protector mm -hmm. but if you are overloading so that is really to offer protection to the equipment from a over charge of electricity mm -hmm. this is not designed to protect the the, the, the the electrical wiring from heating up resistivity, building up in the wire because of the overloading of the circuit. Mm -hmm. All right? So what people need to do is to plan out your home properly mm -hmm. and to have a conversation with your electrician. Make sure that your electrician checks the wiring in your home and determines the load on each circuit and that you are, and you get the proper advice, even from even seeking out, and this is a point that I need to make, your, your homes are approved by the electrical inspectorate. Every five years, you should seek that approval from the electrical inspectorate. So before TNTech can give you a connection, you have to get a certi certificate. So your licensed electrician goes to the, the inspectorate, submits your electrical plan and all of that, and, come, and they come and do an inspection, and they approve you for connection by TNTech. Mm -hmm. But that is not the end of it. Every five years, that certificate is renewable. How many of us know that? Sometimes you build your home 30 years past and you've not sought or you haven't gone to the electrical inspectorate to have that inspection renewed. And I'm saying to you, that is all. Those are some of the strategic measures that you can take to protect your home and your family. Do the right thing. Follow the laws that are there to guide and protect you mm -hmm. administratively. And I'm also saying, you need to stop multi-tapping and you need to stop using um the the heater have you ever had a heater and when the heater started short you roll up the cord and you're still using the heater but that cord is frayed and it's time to get a new cord or to get a new heater yes. but what we do we continue to use it in its oh, dilapidated oh, state oh, we, we wrap we wrap electrical tape wrap around it, it. Mm -hmm. exactly and you continue but you are still creating a source of ignition or a heat source yeah so all of these take into consideration so sometimes um um Rhoda, mm -hmm. we are our own worst enemies sad to say but we are our own worst enemies and what we need to do is to guard against our own bad habits and just eradicate it altogether because we see the outcome and the effects of having a laser fair approach to fire safety in our homes mm -hmm. I want to I want to go back to to my laundry room the dryer. What should I be careful about with respect to my dryer? All right. So the build up of lint in your dryer. Mm -hmm. Everything that you have in your home requires a service or it requires periodical servicing. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to to identifying those equipment which are the highest hazards in your home. So let's talk about your your heater, mm -hmm. water heater, your mm -hmm. dryer and your air condition units. Now, Rhoda, 20 years ago, how many people could have afforded to put an air condition unit in every part of their home? Not very many persons. And I'm I'm one of those persons where each me each of the main rooms, so bedrooms and living rooms, there's an AC unit. And not only that, Rhoda, they are running 24-07. Okay, well, and, and not so bad, and not so bad. <laughs> not so bad, but yes. <laughs> Yes, they, they, they run, right. but yes. But there are because of because of um um you know long ago it was much different. We had a, a greater tolerance for heat and all yeah, those things. Yeah, and I mean our our things. homes were built differently then as well. And I mean at the start of the program much. you were talking about wooden homes, and then we had more wooden homes than we have now. Now we have more concrete structures. Right. So we're moving with the times, and as the times have moved. We recognize that we've gone into a certain level of comfort. We everybody has ACs now, but here's what people do: you you install an AC, 
and, and this is a real thing and we are looking for the cheapest installer yeah that's the first thing yeah so the cheapest installer the let's say you it's twenty five hundred dollars to install at twelve thousand bt you're just saying mm -hmm. install price to the unit and everything mm -hmm. but that person has to run an electrical wiring for that is suitable for that ex, for that type of um, ac not mm -hmm. only that they are also they have to put the necessary isolation in place and a breaker which has the capacity to work with that type of or that unit based on the um the the amperage of that unit mm -hmm. now when you eliminate all of that because you want an ac for 20 2200 or 1800 which is below the standard price i'm just saying then you're going to get a substandard work and a mm -hmm. substandard job mm -hmm. and with that comes now a greater anomalies and the, and the challenges which we see present so we have been notice, noticing that a lot of fires have begun via the wiring that is supplying the ac unit with electricity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if that person doesn't use a, 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 a wire or wiring that is built for the capacity of that unit mm -hmm. that wiring is going to heat up and it is now going to burn out and become a source of ignition and we've seen that happening a lot shoddy workmanship ac units and it becoming involved mm -hmm. also you have to service your units if you are not servicing the unit periodically that compressor is going to trip and it's going to stay on continuously also pull in more electricity so it's better if you service the unit you use less electricity right and it is already one of the biggest consumption of electricity is by your ac unit and by your heater right by your drivers they consume the most amount of electricity in mm -hmm. your in your home it, it actually accounts for over 50 percent of the consumption of electricity in your home what about, by themselves what about kitchen fires because i'm seeing people here on the thread they're talking about grease fires and you know asking how to how to be how to to deal with um grease fires in a kitchen okay that's a, that's a, and also another excellent question and, and what the, your callers or what your 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 viewers are recognizing that there is an actual difference you remember i told, told you earlier on that we classify fires based on what is actually burning yes so it's similarly in your bedroom in your living room we don't have grease and oil and fats mm -hmm. all right but naturally occurring in your kitchen you use a lot of oil you may use butter you may use things that will generate or have of a, of a what we call a carbonate of what we call a oil-based nature mm -hmm. not only that in your kitchen you also have propane in your tanks tanks yeah you may have that tank on the inside or you or if you have the 100 pound it would be on the outside mm -hmm. so that's gas as well so all of these hazards are occurring around the kitchen all right and so kitchen fires has has, has gotten a specific focus when we look at um inspections mm -hmm. your kitchens especially household kitchens are looked at in a special way now the medium that you use on grease and oil and fat cannot be the same thing that you're going to use on the other forms of um, of fires right. reason being oil has the propensity to splash if you were to put a discharge me medium onto the oil just think about it a pebble hits the oil or a pebble hits water it mm -hmm. ripples and splashes mm -hmm. similarly if you pour directly water onto oil the hydrogen molecules in h2o will react with that fire and it will cause a configuration you will be disfigured mm -hmm. and dismembered in that so you really don't want to use water in your kitchen as an extinguishing medium all right you mm -hmm. do not want to ever have a water type extinguisher anywhere near your kitchen All but right? the, the extinguisher and you were telling us about at the start the abc extinguisher would that be useful it would be useful but the technique involved has to change because okay. whereas in your in i taught you or i said to you that you can apply that medium and you can speak. directly uh -huh. right directly to the base to of the, the fire Mm -hmm. of the fire. if you mm -hmm. were to do that with oil it would displace the oil and the oil will splash and it will spread the fire okay so what you would need to do in such a case is to just hit the, the, the ready to the rim of of the of whatever it is and allow the powder to fall on top of the oil of the surface okay, of the, the oil. you really smother. don't want to direct it in, yes right. you don't really want to direct it directly into the oil okay. all right so so but there are specific types of extinguishers which are designed specifically for oil and fat and those extinguishers are the class k or the class f extinguishers which mm -hmm. are for 
kitchen fires. Right. And that has more of more like a like a, it's a wet chemical and it creates a bubble effect mm -hmm. and it comes out in a spray format, not creating that pen penetration into the oil mm -hmm. and it literally creates a covering over the surface of the oil. So those are specific types of extinguishers mainly. So you find a lot of business persons with kitchens, they would they would ask the fire service, so what's the best type of extinguisher for a kitchen, you know? Because mm -hmm. we have a lot of roti, doubles, and yeah. we're frying a lot of the, things. Yeah, frying a lot we of things, and you also have a lot of homes that are doing, they, they, they are actually right. preparing meals for sale. And the thing about it is, and we understand that in the fire service, that's why we know that residential fires come about, because there are a lot of activities that take place in a home mm -hmm. that may not be associated with, with just only the household, but mm -hmm. it's people working and we are dealing with a pandemic scenario and people have to work from home. Mm -hmm. So the fire service understands that and we understand that people have to make a living. Mm -hmm. But we also have to protect ourselves and the thing that we're protecting our families within that whole setup. Okay. All right. So the wet chemical extinguisher. But again, um, Rhoda, if you are not servicing these extinguishers on time, how can we verify the, 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 uh, the efficacy of that extinguisher when we really need it? And so it's not all well and good to just purchase, place on the wall and say, bye-bye. We have to go back to it. Check it monthly. Agreed. And when you see that gauge starts to lose pressure, you know, I have to carry this thing to service So it. maintenance and upkeep is very important. Preventative maintenance is the key. Mm -hmm. All right. And practice your evacuation plan. Enact your plan and practice. Mm -hmm. And it's the only way. And when that becomes part of the nature of how we operate as as, as as a people in Trinidad and Tobago. Because I can tell you, in the United States, especially in places like California and those places where bushfires can ravish an entire... And you've seen these type of fires in Australia. Mm -hmm. You've seen them in where these wild fires that run through communities, mm -hmm. they take fire safety seriously. When they are advised by their fire department, these people take it very, very seriously. Because it, it has an effect of totally eradicating um, um, villages and, and, and towns. So they don't take this thing lightly. All right. So in Trinidad, we need to develop the same approach to these things. And it's very unfortunate that we have to wait till a, a major occurrence takes place before the focus is placed on this. Now, the dry season, I know it's a, that's one time of the year where we focus a lot on bushfires right and the impact that bushfires can have on um on communities in general because it wouldn't just be homes it would it could also be businesses but is there any other time of the year outside of the dry season and bushfires is there an, another time of the year where we where you know there's a higher prevalence of, of fires taking place that's an excellent excellent question and um i think one of my video addresses um that but there is a period of time when we have a lot of festivities mm -hmm. um and that festive time is around the diwali time yeah. when we have a lot of fireworks we have bursting of bamboo we have all these nice things that we do and i i love i love to see the place Fire light up and looking all I, I can go to the video if you want me to go to the video you want me to go to right, the video? let me just introduce the video now and, and talk about the christmas period sure ladies and gentlemen we love christmas everybody here loves christmas mm -hmm. and around christmas time you know we light up and we have all these strings of lights lighting up around your home mm -hmm. all right and we have the, the the fireworks that comes about with the new year and we have noticed that this is a season and a time, Diwali and Christmas, New Year, when we have seen the increase or the uptick in the occurrence of household fires, residential fires. So go ahead with the video. Okay, all right. These are unpredictable and can escalate rapidly. Making the wrong decision can cost you all your possessions and even your life. In the event of a fire, you can either fight or flight. Small fires should be extinguished using an extinguisher by trained personnel only. However, if a fire reaches the ceiling, do not attempt to fight the fire. You should evacuate immediately using the following steps. Raise an alarm. Call the fire service at 990. Evacuate. Move briskly. Do not run as this can create panic. Never go in search of possessions. Assemble at the muster point, conduct a roll call to ensure everyone is accounted for. 
Give the results of the roll call and other relevant information to the fire service personnel on arrival. Remember, fire, fire safety, safety begins, begins with, with you. you. So one of the things um, I noticed here, you all have a social media presence now because I noticed that there are Facebook and Instagram um, icons there. So should folks feel free to go to your Facebook and Instagram pages and, and follow? Is it that you're, you're putting information up there now? There's, it, it's a regular sharing of information to the public because a lot of what you said here this evening is so important that it would be very useful to have it be up on these platforms. Definitely, definitely. So the fire service is in that transition phase where we are focusing on that social distancing aspect. And for that, we have now promoting the Facebook page. Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service has its own Facebook page where mm -hmm. we populate that with information, current information in relation to what you should focus on. So if it's mm -hmm. bushfire season, you will see a healthy amount of information coupled with the other agencies, governmental agencies that are um, charged with that responsibility, for instance, the, the forestry division and rural um, development ministry and all those ministries as well. Also, we have an Instagram page that is TTFS, TT underscore fire service, where you can go and again, we would focus on the good. We would even focus on some of the things that are not so well, that is not working so well, but we are focused on improving mm -hmm. the, the, the image and also the message that is being um, sent out to members of the public. Now and you, that is vitally important. For you us. mentioned before that people can email the, the fire service. So do, do you have the email address or offhand? All right. Um, so what we want to, to do um, is focus on the social media pages for now. And I'll okay. tell you why. We're in okay. a bit of transformation where we are building out so that we get our .gov TT mm -hmm. um, emails up and running in a right. full way. Right. Um, so... The fire service, you can focus on the, and our website is also being redone. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that we are transforming. So www.ttfs fire service is, is going to go through our whole revamping stage. Right. So I would not want to focus in on an email right now. Gotcha. Because I want to send you to no, that's, platforms that's where you will that's... get where you get a proper response. That's absolutely and a quick fine. Response as well. So Facebook so and Instagram. Now, Facebook and Instagram, we have a, a, a communications department unit within the fire service, again, working towards responding to members of the public. Mm -hmm. You can go on there. We, I think on our Facebook page, we have 30,000 plus followers, right? And that's a big step. That is us. a big step because and that's, that's, as many, that's yeah. almost as many followers as I've got. <laughs> right, and, and, and the thing is, and, and, and that's a good sign because it means that members of the public see the fire service as the subject matter expert yes. on when it comes to public safety and fire. Mm -hmm. And and that leads me to another point, Rhoda, that um, I think is so vitally important. The fire service is not only involved in protecting members of the public from fire. The fire service mandate first and foremost to protect property and life mm -hmm. from fires. Yes but other emergencies and also humanitarian service being the mandate of the fire service. Mm -hmm. So when you put such a wide, wide gambit of, of activities, you can see that the fire service can range from accidents on the highway where we have to use the jaws of life. Mm -hmm. You also have to look at if, if a, a, a vehicle goes over a cliff in Maracas, who's charged with the responsibility of rappelling down to that 300 down precipice and bring those and you know we brought persons back up alive from scenarios like that right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we have a land search and rescue team that mm -hmm. is charged with that responsibility and they are training and constantly training and their equipment has to be constantly upgraded for them to be able to effect rescue situations mm -hmm. so also in a hurricane scenario where we have a national disaster earthquake and fire service together with our supporting agencies trinidad and tobago defense force trinidad and tobago police force also the ODPM and other arms of the protective services come together under the gambit of the ODPM. But the first responders, and I must reiterate, is the fire service. Mm -hmm. The first team that gets out there on the ground and makes that assessment is your fire service. So please do not look at your fire service as, as just 
sitting there in the station waiting for a fire to occur. In fact, nothing could be further from the, the truth. What we have to do is to constantly scan our environment, constantly conduct um, familiarization tours, have our servicemen be ready and stay in a state of high readiness for in the event of an emergency. And that is what the, the that is the, the value of a Trinidad and Tobago fire service. And I want members of the public to understand that. Fire officer, um, fire sub officer Rogers, that is this is where we are gonna wrap it up. I think that's the that, that's the absolute most perfect note that we can wrap it up on. I'm going to invite everybody to please go and look for their Facebook and Instagram pages. Like, subscribe, follow, and keep up to date on the information that they have there. And I'm going to invite you back. At some point in time, I'm going to have you back for us to continue this conversation about fire safety awareness. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. my Thank impromptu you. call today. Thank you very much. Thank you, you so much. And you. we are always here to see you. Thank okay. you. Great. Have a good evening and I hope you get some rest because I know you had a long day today. Thank you very much. Will do. Take care. Bye. So that was Fire Sub Officer Jude Rogers who would have taken my phone call this morning and arranged to get permission to be able to have a conversation with us this evening. I hope you all found it informative. I hope you learned something about it. I hope you are now going to go and take a look at your homes and see what you need to put in place, how you need to improve, what you need to check to ensure that your home is as safe as possible with respect to prevention of fires. And with that, I'm going to, I'm going to, to, to wrap things up. So I will see you guys tomorrow evening. We're going back into our emancipation conversations tomorrow evening. So I will see you on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. And we're going to continue to be talking about the things that are pertinent and critical to us as we head into emancipation. Take care. Hey, it's Galen the Fire Chief. It's bringing the flame storm from now to the hill. Hey! I'm the fireman. Fire's in my hand. Raging through the land.